Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, and actually the next two, we're going to be discussing some ascending pathways within the nervous system. Now, an ascending pathway is a pathway that relays information, that is sensory information, from the periphery, so it could be out in the legs, the arms, anywhere, and it relays it into the central nervous system and up to the brain for interpretation. Okay? Um, in videos after these, we're going to be looking at descending pathways, and those go the opposite direction. Those are motor pathways that go from the brain, uh, really the, the cortex, down the central nervous system and then out to the periphery. So they go in opposite directions. So there are three major ascending pathways that we're going to be looking at. The first one, which is this video, is going to be the DCML pathway. And we're also going to see in the next video, spinal thalamic pathway, and then after that, the trigeminal pathway. Okay. So here we're going to be looking at the DCML pathway. And before we get into the details of this, I want to go over some basics of these three ascending pathways. Okay. So with these ascending pathways, they are set up in a system of three neurons. There is a first order neuron, a second order neuron, and a third order neuron. So forgetting the details for just a moment, the first order neuron, or neurons we should say, they're going to relay information from a sensory receptor ultimately into the nervous system to some point. Okay? And then that first order neuron will synapse with a second order neuron, and then that second order neuron will synapse with a third order neuron, and it's always the third order neuron, which here is shown in black at the top, that's going to relay that information to the cortex of the brain, that is the somatosensory cortex. Okay? All three of these are set up as a three neuron system. First order, second order, and third order neuron. Second thing I want to go over is this is what the picture is. Okay? This blue rectangle really just represents the nervous system. Okay? Down here at the bottom is the lowest levels. Okay? So maybe down in the spinal cord somewhere. At the top of this, uh, this is up at the cortex of the brain. Okay? And then this middle line down the center is just that. It's a, it's a midline. And the reason we do that and show this is because most of these pathways, actually all three of these, are actually going to cross over to the other side. And so we need to know where that crossing over occurs, so we draw a midline, a vertical midline. And then these horizontal lines right here, okay, these represent different levels of the nervous system. So for example, this bottom dotted line, this is the entry level of the spinal cord. In other words, wherever the first order neurons enter the spinal cord. This entire length actually here is the spinal cord. It's long, right? This dotted line is the medulla. This level is the pons, thalamus, and cortex. I think you get the idea. Okay? And that's the pattern we're going to be using in all three of these videos. And then the final thing to remember here is just a few definitions. Okay? So if we talk about a ganglion, okay, ganglion or pleural ganglia, those are clusters of cell bodies outside of the central nervous system. So recall that neurons are going to have a cell body and they're going to have axons. The cluster of cell bodies outside of the central nervous system is called a ganglion. A cluster of cell bodies within the central nervous system is called a nucleus. So nucleus and ganglion are almost identical except that the nucleus is within the central nervous system and ganglion is outside. And just like we have those terms uh, for outside and inside the central nervous system, we can do the same thing for axons. So a cluster or bundle of axons outside the central nervous system is called a nerve. We're really not going to see that here. But then a cluster of axons inside the central nervous system, so all these right here, these are tracts. Okay? And in these pictures, it looks like I've only drawn one neuron. Okay? But really, remember, these are bundles of neurons. There's a lot of them. Okay? It's just one is drawn in each case for simplicity. Okay, let's start going over the DCML pathway. So what does DCML stand for? It stands for dorsal columns medial lemniscus. Okay? That's fairly complicated, but we'll see each of those pieces here in the pathway. Okay? Now, the first thing I want to talk about is the first order neurons right here. There's actually two shown, and that's because uh, the different colors represent where the information is coming from. These first order neurons right here are called pseudo-unipolar neurons. That's their classification. And that just means they have a central cell body right here, and then they have a distal axon 
and a proximal axon that leads into the spinal cord and up it. Okay, so that's a that's a pseudo unipolar neuron. And so if we look at the pseudo unipolar neurons, we can see that the distal axon or the distal axonal extension is going to relay information from a peripheral sensory receptor to this cell body, which is located in the dorsal root ganglion coming off of the spinal cord. And then the proximal axon is going to lead into the central nervous system. The same thing goes for this neuron right here. Now in this video, the red one, this is going to bring in information from the upper extremities. The green one is going to bring in information from the lower extremities. Okay? And so we're now going to talk about those. So just for now, let's consider information coming from the upper extremities. So we've got our first order neuron here. It's pseudo unipolar. We've got the distal extension of the axon, bringing information from a sensory receptor to cell bodies in the dorsal root ganglion. And then the proximal extension brings information from the dorsal root ganglion cell bodies into the spinal cord. Now, when these axons come into the spinal cord, and it doesn't matter which of these two we're talking about, red or green, those axons are now called tracts. They're going to ascend up the spinal cord like this, as you see right here. They're going to ascend up the spinal cord. To really visualize this ascension, we're going to look at this picture. So here's a cross section of the spinal cord. This is just one level of the spinal cord. It's kind of like you took a cucumber and you put it up vertically, standing up, and then you just cut it into slices, right? That's what this is. Remember that the spinal cord really is like one giant pillar. So the spinal cord will extend vertically upward as a pillar and it will reach the medulla, right? Because the spinal cord is continuous with the medulla oblongata. And so if you imagine the spinal cord really is one giant pillar, then you can think of miniature pillars inside the larger pillar. Or if you wanna view the spinal cord as a column, there are miniature columns inside the larger column. And if we look at the posterior part of the spinal cord, so dorsal, we've got a couple of columns right here on each side, okay? This is actually the patient's right over here. So these two columns right here, this light green one, light yellow one, these would be the two right dorsal columns. And that is actually where the name dorsal columns comes from in the name. So we've got some columns that basically lie inside the spinal cord and they go vertically up with the spinal cord. They're columns, right? And they're on the dorsal aspect, so they are dorsal columns. Now, within those dorsal columns, we have bundles of axons of these first order neurons, okay? Those two bundles of axons are called fasciculus cuneatus and fasciculus gracilis. What's the difference between these? So first of all, what about this red one right here? Well, again, if we follow that proximal axon of the first order neuron, once it gets into that spinal cord region, the dorsal column, it ascends upward. And those axons ascend upward together as fasciculus cuneatus. And again, this is relaying information from the upper extremity. So fasciculus cuneatus is part of the upper extremity system. Okay. If we look at the green axon right here, or the green neuron, if we follow the proximal axon right here of the first order neuron, when it gets to that dorsal column region, it's going to ascend upward, and these axons ascend upward as the fasciculus gracilis, and that's relaying information from the lower extremity. And collectively, these two fasciculi are running in those dorsal columns. Now, the important thing to remember here is that the fasciculus gracilis, so information coming from the lower extremity, that's more medial, and we could call that the medial of the dorsal columns. The fasciculus cuneatus is bringing information from the upper extremity, and that one is the more lateral of the two dorsal columns. So upper extremity is lateral, lower extremity is medial. And in terms of learning the names, the way I remember it, Gracilis is literally a muscle in the lower extremity. It's one of your hip adductors. So because gracilis is in the lower extremity, uh, this is relaying information from the lower extremity. Okay? So both these fasciculi, fasciculus cuneatus, fasciculus gracilis, they ascend up the spinal cord until they reach the medulla. Okay? That's the most complicated part right there. It gets a little bit easier as we go on, and then the other pathways are actually quite a bit easier. So remember that a first order neuron synapses with a second order neuron. And so the end of these axons that are part of the fasciculi, uh, which are part of the first order neurons, 
um, they're going to synapse with the cell bodies of second order neurons. Now remember what a cluster of cell bodies is in the central nervous system. It's a nucleus, or it collectively nuclei. Okay? So for example, if we consider the red one right here, the axons of the fasciculus cuneatus, those axons are going to synapse with the cell bodies of the second order neurons right here that are part of nucleus cuneatus. So if we look at the red system right here, again, we're going to have these axons that are going to synapse with the cell bodies of the second order neurons here, also in red. And these cell bodies, the cluster of them, is called nucleus cuneatus. Again, fasciculus cuneatus synapses with the cell bodies that are called nucleus cuneatus. If we look at the green system right here, again, this is coming from the lower extremity, but we have the axons here of the first order neuron. They are gonna synapse with the cell bodies of the green second order neuron. And those cell bodies, the cluster of them, is nucleus gracilis. Okay? So again, the terms gracilis and cuneatus are conserved here. Nucleus gracilis is still medial. Nucleus cuneatus is still lateral. But now we're in the second order neurons. Okay? And this synapse occurs at the level of the medulla oblongata. Okay? Now, regardless of which one of these tracts we're now talking about, because now we're moving away from the cell bodies, we're looking at the axons, right? Regardless of which one of these we're talking about, these tracts decussate, or decussate, some people will pronounce it. Decussate means to cross over. So notice, if this over here on this side of the image is the patient's right side, okay, remember from the patient's perspective, if this is the right side over here, um, then this is the left over here, and notice that these tracks at the level of the medulla cross over from the right to the left. That decussation is extremely important, and for any one of these pathways, you need to know where the decussation occurs, because clinical manifestations of lesions of different parts of the nervous system are a function of where that decussation occurs. We can do a very rudimentary look over here in the spinothalamic system or pathway and we can see the decussation occurs at a very different level. So make sure you remember where the decussation occurs. Now after that decussation occurs and those tracts have now crossed over, the second order neurons together, those axons, ascend together. And they ascend together collectively as the medial lemniscus. Okay, so again, these axons, these tracts, doesn't matter if it's from the lower extremity or the upper extremity. They're running up together, and collectively they're termed as they ascend up the medial lemniscus. Okay, and they ascend up the remainder of the medulla, they ascend up through the pons, and they ascend up to the thalamus. Now the thalamus contains a lot of nuclei, but one of them is the VPL nucleus, the ventral posterolateral lateral nucleus. And that's where the cell bodies of the third order neurons are. So as we would expect, these second order neurons synapse with the cell body of the third order neuron. And then this third order neuron carries or relays that information vertically uh, from the ventral posterolateral lateral nucleus of the thalamus to the primary and then eventually secondary somatosensory cortex. And that's how you get information from the upper extremity and lower extremity receptors, ultimately to the cerebral cortex. Now, the question, of course, remains, what information is that? I wanted to get through this detail first before we talk about this. So when we talk about the DCML pathway, um, it doesn't matter if we're talking about the lateral part, which is from the upper extremity, or the medial part, which is from the lower extremity. Um, the three sensations that are going to be relayed are discriminative light touch, Okay. Um, this is very, very, very light touch to the skin where you can actually have two-point discrimination. So in other words, if you took two toothpicks right next to each other and touched the, them to the body, the person would be able to discriminate between the two points. They'd be able to say, well, it's two toothpicks touching me rather than one. Okay. So that's discriminative light touch. Conscious proprioception is basically if you close your eyes, so take vision out of the equation, and basically extend your index finger and just move it somewhere around to your side, okay? So basically abduct your shoulder, get your pointer finger, point to the right wall basically, or left wall. And then as your eyes are closed, take your finger and touch your nose, okay? Assuming that your DCML pathway is intact, you should be able to take your finger, doesn't matter where you start it from, and you should be able to bring it to your nose pretty easily. So you know where your limbs and your digits and so forth are in space, okay? 
Unconscious proprioception is a different pathway. Those are adjustments that are made that we are not aware of. And then also vibration. Okay, Those are the three sensations that are relayed through the DCNL pathway. So in a nutshell, these are conscious relay systems, all three of these actually. And that just means that we are aware of them. Okay, We are aware of these sensations. So what does fidelity have to do with? Well, fidelity really has to do with this idea that we can localize a sensation so our brain will have a map of our entire body and so our brain will know exactly where we felt the sensation. So did this touch occur on your arm? Did it occur on your hand, your elbow, your forearm? Where on your forearm did it occur? So we can actually map that sensation and know exactly where it occurred. Okay? Low fidelity pathways cannot do that. Okay? They cannot map the pain um, as well. They can't localize it as well. So all three of these not only are conscious, we're aware of them, but they're also high fidelity. And so that means they are somatotopically mapped. And we'll go over that concept as it relates to the sensory homunculus in a separate video. Okay? The only other things to really worry about here are making sure that you understand where the pathway decussates. It decussates at the medulla. Okay? That's where it crosses over. And then you might also see this ascends and it ascends ipsilaterally. So this is an ipsilateral pathway. What that means is ascension is we look at how it goes up the spinal cord. Okay, So does it go up the spinal cord on the same side that it entered the nervous system right here? Yes, it does, because it's entering the nervous system on the patient's right side. It's also ascending up the spinal cord on the right side. That makes this an ipsilateral pathway. If it crossed over at the level of the spinal cord and then ascended up this side, well, then it would be a contralateral pathway. And we'll actually see that the spinal thalamic pathway is contralateral. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the DCML pathway. This is by far, I think, the most complicated of the three. Um, the other two should go a little bit quicker, but hopefully this gave you a good understanding. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.